Welcome to Pod Songs, where we interview inspirational people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today's guest is Judy Wicks, an activist, entrepreneur, author, and speaker working to build a more compassionate, just, regenerative, and locally-based economy. Well, thanks so much for agreeing to have this conversation. I know you don't like to talk about yourself and, you know, we can keep that to a minimum, you know, absolute. Well, whatever works. Yeah. You just... So tell me again, you're going to write a song about whatever, yeah. you're going to write a song yeah. about this? Yeah, because I need inspiration. That's one, of the, yeah. that's one of the reasons, you know, because I'm always singing about myself. And, you know, I've, I think I've covered everything now after so many years and it's getting a bit repetitive, but also I want to be of service to other people exactly like you're doing, you know, the way I'm a songwriter, so I can give service and maybe there's a song for your, your Bali network or some, or some, some way to be, to be of service to you in service to others. That would be great. The Bali network, I started that 20. 21 years ago, but I'm not involved in that. And now they've changed the name to Common Future. And it has a whole different, well, not a whole different agenda, but it's it's now it's, uh, it's focused on equality. So it's a hundred percent that where before that was part of our mission, but not all of it. Um, but anyway, I have a new group now called All Together Now, uh, All Together Now, Pennsylvania. And I, I would love to have a a theme song for that. You know, that song's of course, been you done though. Yeah, I was going to say, you always think of the Beatles song, <laughs> all together now, all together now. But anyway, what I'm doing now, I started that a couple of years ago and to, well, with, with several purposes, but part of the inspiration is to, is to meet the challenge of climate change, that we have to change the way we live in order to, for civilization to survive. And at the same time we're doing that, we need to address racial equality and economic uh, um, inequality and also but uh, other ways in which we're destroying the environment besides climate change, <laughs> just destruction of the environment. So anyway, I, I, I feel that the best way to, to approach all these problems is by decentralizing, you know, by decentralizing our economy, it decentralizing our food system, our energy system, and our, our means of, of producing basic needs. So, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. One is that we can no longer rely on long distance global supply chains because they're going to be increasingly disrupted by weather, uh, by cyber warfare, by type of terrorism, by pandemics and, and by general so social uprising that's going to come more and more from, from the change in climate. So, um, the pandemic, at least in the United States, kind of proved the point that the centralized supply chains, uh, you know, the centralized food production, industrial food production, couldn't couldn't pivot. They they, they collapsed uh, in the United States, and the grocery store shelves were empty at one point. But the small farmers, the local food system, actually did rise up and figure out a way um, to serve serve the people. So uh, that was kind of a small example of of what I'm talking about. So we're, we're working to unite rural and urban communities uh, to, to build local supply chains to produce our basic needs. So we have a coalition around food, a coalition around clothing and textiles, a coalition around sustainable building materials, a coalition around plant medicine, and we're developing uh, one in uh, renewable energy and, and zero waste. So, um, and then as we're building these supply chains, we're doing it through the lens of racial justice. So. How can we provide more ownership opportunities? You know, as we're relocalizing, we need more businesses. How can we make sure that some of those new businesses um, are, are black owned? In Philadelphia, half the population are, are people of color, but black businesses are only like two and a half percent ownership. So we're a statewide organization, but we're based in Philly and Philly's the largest city. So a lot of our work emanates from Philadelphia. So, you know, it's no small task at addressing all these things at once, but in my mind, that's the only way to do it. We, we, ha we have to look at every part of our, our lifestyle and every part of our economy and, and, and make a basic tra um, transformation of the way we do business and the way we live our lives. Um, or, we're not, or human beings are not gonna make it. And there's not a lot of time. So I feel a sense of urgency about that. The whole, you know, 
there's so much separation in the United States. I don't know how it is in Italy, but um, there there is a rural urban divide that Trump has taken advantage of and made it worse so that there's a lack of mis lack of trust and understanding between rural and urban people. Historically, that wasn't the case. Historically, uh, when economies were localized, rural and urban people co-created uh, the economic system. They co-created the local supply chains and it was based on trust and understanding and interdependent. It was, it was really globalization that destroyed local economies, you know, and severed those local supply chains that connected the rural and the urban. And neither community has recovered from that. And in the United States, that's where the opioid epidemic is, you know, in the, in the mm -hmm. rural land where the farm, the small farms have gone out of business, the small towns have been, you know, disempowered. And then in the city, the factory workers, you know, have lost their jobs, you know, so, and that's where people are taking opioids and whatnot. And there's this despair um, and anger. And so I feel like a byproduct of our work is trying to heal this divide in our society of, of bringing people together. So all together now, you know, is the whole idea that the only way that we're going to move forward as a civilization is to do it together. And it needs to be inclusive and not leave people behind and that we need everybody. And that a lot of our work, we have to move from the individualism and the competition that the capitalist system has ingrained in us and um, move towards the cooperation and, and, and generosity and sharing and, and, and move, you know, our our measure of success are away from profit and how much we have materially, how big our house, how many cars, to having the measure of success be, you know, how healthy are our, our communities and how healthy is our natural, natural environment. Part of our work is to raise consciousness. And maybe that's where a song could come in. <laughs> you okay, know? yeah. Yeah, to, to raise consciousness that we are all interconnected, that, that all people, all, all of life, all of nature, we're all interconnected and that we, uh, that we need to make economic decisions based on that. So when we make an economic decision as a consumer, as a business owner, as a investor, that rather than doing so to maximize profits and material accumulation, that we make these decisions maximizing the well-being um, of our communities and our natural environment. So it's a whole, so that's part of our work is, is just the consciousness, the consciousness raising and changing our measure of success and changing our values away from competition to cooperation and away from hoarding and accumulation, you know, to, to sharing and, 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 uh, and away from individualism, you know, to mm -hmm. community. So moving from me to we. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause when I was researching mm -hmm. you, there was, you know, it's difficult to keep track of you. Like you've done so many different organizations and, but there, there is that red line that you seem to be really focused on throughout all those years is that the local is the solution to you know, inequality, racial injustice, individualism, all, all these, all these yeah. issues you're talking about, you know, so. Right. Because, you know, I, I, I belong to this business organization and their, their slogan is changing the way the world does business. Well, you can't just change the way the world does business. You got to start somewhere. You know, people have these grandiose ideas, but where we really have the power to actually do something is in our own communities because it's all about relationships. And it's about, to me, you know, local self-reliance, you know, if we control the means of production, you know, how our basic needs are produced, if we own that, it, it, it builds community wealth. Right now, we're just, we are pawns in the corporate system. You know, we, we buy all their junk and as well as our basic needs. And that, that wealth is leaving all of our communities and, and, and piling up in these uh, huge corporate oligarchies, basically, you know, that are really international, uh, multinational corporations that affects the whole. And so they're sucking up everything and they're, you know, destroying the environment along the way and causing great unhappiness and people turn on each other. And that's part of the plan here. You know, it's always been the part of the, the, the plan of the, the powerful to, to pit people against each other and, the, you know, uh, pitting poor whites against uh, blacks, for instance, that's how they pulled off a lot of stuff in the United States. Um, you know, just even creating the concept of, of black and white and, the, and, and white superiority. I think, you know, that that's part of the way that the power elite is able to control, control because the majority of people don't, don't want it this way. We, we want to have greater equality and, and greater freedom. So, you know, it's, it's another form of tyranny, you know, and, and, and Gandhi, 
Gandhi, you know, I, I, I take a lot from Gandhi because when he was trying to free um, India from the British, you know, his advice was grow your own food, you know, make your own clothing. We're, we grow the flax and cotton and we send it off to Europe where they make it into clothes and then we buy those clothes. Uh, so let's just stop doing that. And that's why you see him at the spinning wheel. You know, he's spinning the, he's making his own clothes, the homespun. Um, so it's about, as he taught about self-reliance, the community gardens, you know, the village communities and so on. So he was the, he was the grandfather of this philosophy. Um, and, you know, and I, and I, so he's a, my mentor, so to speak. And, uh, and I, t I totally believe that that's the case. That the, that we have to that decentralizing the economy gives us economic economic power. If we have power over our means of production, our basic needs, that keeps wealth within our communities, and it it gives us, you know, the power of self reliance um, as a community. And what we need to do is, is for people to understand it's not about individual self reliance. That's that's what the right wing is always talking about. You know, it's you know the the lone cowboy is the you know the the image that people aspire to and but that's not but what's really is is community self-reliance that there is no such thing as individual self-reliance you know um and that you have to work as a community you know to build to build self-reliance uh, community self-reliance so that everybody can uh, live so anyway i'm going on forever here but <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting what you said about yeah, you said about gandhi because i just had vandana shiva another of the great people i get to speak to with this show and you know, she's over there in India campaigning for the farmers and, you know, she used to have to fight Monsanto to get the, the seeds yes. and now she's having to fight Bill Gates, you know, so this, this co corporate colonialism is just exactly. everywhere. Well, I, I know her. She invited me to speak in India. Oh, wow. The only time I went to India was by her invitation. She has something called the Howard Lectures, uh, Howard and Gandhi's birthday, October 4th. So I was one of the speakers one year. Oh, so I flew over there with my daughter, and then after the speech and everything, she took us up to Dehradun, something like Dehradun. That's her hometown in the north of it of um, India. So we took my daughter and I took the train with Vandana up to her hometown, uh, and she showed us her seed vault, and and I gave it a little talk there, little you know community. I guess she has like a her nonprofit is based there, but she's a she's a great warrior. <laughs> and you compared notes on Gandhi. Well, to, to some extent, and in my lecture, you no, know, I, 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 I told the story about how Gandhi, to me, is the for, the grandfather of this movement for localization. Mm. And yeah, I got to, this is my first and only time to India, so I, I really appreciate it because it's so important to me, his work. And he was the inspiration for Martin Luther King, you know, which is my American hero. <laughs> right. Well, because there's these good aspects to globalization. In, in in the idea of thought and interconnectedness yes but right and it's the same with technology you know technology is a wonderful thing yes. and you know but it was always seems to be the dark side that comes up and always just take brings it brings it down now. yeah well my my vision is that the global economy be comprised of a network of regional economies that are self-reliant in their basic needs, but trade globally and what is what they have access in and also what's unique to the region. What is our music, our culture, our best cheese, our best wine, our our fashion, our, our local innovation. So these things Information. We, we want to you know, trade globally, but what we need to survive are food, clothing, building materials, medicine, so on, is locally produced. And so you know, right now, it's the corporations that have the power of all the basic needs, and they ship things around, and we buy from them and whatnot. But we we could eliminate the corporations, you mm. know, and just uh, uh, trade amongst each other. Um, you know, and there's a lot of that going on. You know, so the then the global trade would be fair trade. You know, between um, between self reliant, you know, regional economies, because we always want to exchange the uniqueness, but we are losing the uniqueness of our regions because of corporate control and, and monoculture culture that a lot of the indigenous languages are being lost in the, in the traditions and the art forms and so on. Um, so localization helps to preserve those and to make them even more valuable 
in the global marketplace. And so, you know, communications and artistic endeavors and so on <clears throat> will always be something of great value, you know, that, that we want to exchange. Um, and, but we're, we're even losing that, you know, through the monoculture, mm. the, the, the corporate, uh, you know, Western monoculture. Yeah. But how, how, and a lot of, yeah. how quick, how quickly has this happened though? I mean, because in the book you talk about when you grow up, I mean, how long, how much, how far gone are we? How many years? It's hard to say because I'm sure it's been gradual. Like in my, I, I witnessed, as you saw in the book, the change between having a local hardware store and a local pharmacy and a local butcher and a local grocery store into malls. I remember when the first mall was built that brought in the, the, the chains, the, uh, you know, the national chains and so on that put out of business, the, the little mom and pop, you know, businesses. So I, I witnessed that in the, in the sixties, fifties, well, sixties, I guess it started in the fifties. I don't, I, it's hard to remember mm. now. Yeah. The fifties started because I was, uh, I was, I don't think I was even in high school when the, when the hardware store closed. Oh, so it's, you know, I, I, I guess it started after World War II. You know, that's also when the, the big changes in agriculture happened because, you know, we had all the stockpile of, um, ammunition and bullets and warfare stuff and they're trying to find an economic use for it so they turn it into fertilizer right. when so our fertilizers are full of you know fossil fuels and whatnot and that that's destroyed the topsoil and industrialized farming and we had right after world war ii you know i forget the name of who was president then but it was butts was the agricultural secretary in the united states and so he said you know, that the farms should go fence post to fence post and that it, you either had to get big or get out. And so he, he was the one that started in the federal government starting to imagine that what we wanted was these large corporate plantations, basically, um, that excluded the small local farmers and that we were going to do large scale production for exports. And they started to destroy rural America. And uh, so, you know, I guess, you know, so the 50s is when it started, okay. it started to change. I, in my opinion, I'm not a historian. No, no, <laughs> but just in a basically in a lifetime. Yeah, yeah, in one generation. I think so. yeah. yeah, yeah. Because also in the book, you're talking about indigenous languages. These formative experiences you had was going to an Eskimo village for a year. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so how did that, how did that come about in the first place? I was in Vista. Uh, Vista is a, like the Peace Corps. It's a the, the domestic peace corps okay and i was during the, the vietnam war when we graduated my husband and i graduated from college and we um if we didn't do something he would he could be drafted once you graduate when you're in college there was a draft deferment eventually they, they got rid of that but um because it was a very poor, very unfair to poor kids so that if you couldn't afford college you got drafted and so everybody that could afford it got into college to take themselves from being drafted so they finally ch did change that. But anyway, you had to think of something. Everybody, when they graduated from college, had to figure out how to keep from being drafted. And, and some people left the country, you know, draft evaders or went underground. My husband's older brother went underground. He, he just disappeared in New York City to hide so he wouldn't be drafted. But anyway, that's why, I mean, I like the idea of going, to, we, 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 we're going to go into Peace Corps because I, I thought it'd be really cool to go someplace, not another country, but it took too long to get into the Peace Corps and we were afraid he would be drafted at first. So it was easy to get into Vista. And uh, we signed up to be in a large Eastern city because I always imagined, I was from a small town and I imagined I wanted to go to New York or Philadelphia or Boston. I wanted to be in a large Eastern city. So we applied for that, but we were sent to an Indian reservation for training for an Indian reservation out West. And well, while we were training, they asked if there was a married couple who would volunteer to go to Alaska because they needed, a, you had to be married in order to go because it was so isolated. So we just said, let's put our hands up. We did. And off we, off we were sent to Alaska, <laughs> but it was, a, it was, I believe that, that, that witnessing a culture based on sharing and, and, you know, in cooperation to, to witness that helped me to see that such a, such a culture was possible and one that had has lasted for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and so even though I didn't think about it outwardly, I, I think it's a part what gave me the courage to make my big decision. I don't know if um, you've come to this in the book, but my big turning point in my life was at my restaurant. 
I had been uh, building up a network of farmers that were supplying the white dog. I thought that the best thing I could do was to have the best possible practices within my company, buying from local farmers, using renewable energy, composting, paying a living wage, you know, all these these good practices. Um, and I was very proud of the farmers, the, the network of farmers, and it became our market niche mm -hmm. or our competitive advantage was that we bought from the farmers. But then I realized that that, that wasn't enough. That, and I saw that what was really needed was a whole food system that all the restaurants should be buying from farmers, that having the white dog buy from these farmers was not enough and that we needed to build the system, you know, and that I had to work with my competitors, you know, to, to build, to build a, a viable food system for our region. So that's when I say that I moved from me to we, uh, that I realized that my, my future uh, success and that of the farmers and all of us relied on cooperation, interdependence and sharing and so on. And so it, it was, it was scary for me because I, I didn't know what would happen when I gave up my, my, you know, my, my, my market niche, when I shared it with others, I started a non, a nonprofit fair food because I didn't want it, me as a restaurant owner to go around to other restaurant owners and tell them what to do. Hmm. You know, so I started a nonprofit and then she took our list of our farmers and turned it into like a brochure for fair food and so on. And went around and talked to the other restaurants about how to buy from farmers. And we would have events, you know, chef farmer events and all that kind of stuff. And we really jump-started, you know, the the farm to table movement in, in our region. So that, you know, I, I look back on that moment when I, I mean, I was, I was a socially responsible business person. I was doing everything right, but that is not enough. You know, we need, we need to actually grow that consciousness to look at the whole system. Uh, at our place within it. We have to work cooperatively to build that system and then we can compete within it. Friendly competition, which chef can, can make the best dishes you know, from the local produce. Uh, so there's still a healthy competition, but it's not the kind of competition where you want the other guy to go out of business. Right. You know, it's, uh, you know, because you need a lot of restaurants and so on. Um, so, you know, so, th so that was, that was my, my moment of transformation. And I, and I believe that psychologically, I was able to make that decision because of my experience in the Eskimo Bill. Now, I didn't think about that consciously when I made that decision, but I think it was the foundation for making that decision um, was that I, I learned, um, I saw, you know, a society that worked in that way, that, that shared and, and it was, it was all for one and one for all. You know, some people call that communism. <laughs> mm. I mean, that's the other thing growing up in the 50s and the 60s in the United States where we were taught to hide under our desk from the communists, you know, the communists going to burn a, a bomb us, so hide under your desk and would have fire drills and whatnot. And, the, and, and, and people began to, to mistake community for communism. And whenever you talk about cooperation, community and so on, oh, you're a communist. I mean, they're still doing it now. They're, they're calling Biden a socialist. They certainly called uh, Obama a socialist when he came up with Obamacare, that, that that was socialism, that's bad. Now, the, the the cool thing is, is that the younger people are embracing socialism, you know, democratic socialism, like Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist. Mm. And he he was, you know, a front runner for the president of the United States. So I think the United States is, in fact, moving towards a more humane, interdependent, cooperative, sharing, you know, framework. But we're not there yet. The other side is still using the same old 1950s communist rhetoric, mm. you know, Biden, Biden is ruining the country. He's turning us into communists. And that's what, that's what they, that, that's supposed to, that's the boogie, the boogeyman is the commies. You know? <laughs> but the irony is that they're friends with, with, with Putin, you know, mm. because of Trump, you know, I mean, Trump is, he's, he's a fascist, you know? Mm. Uh, and so they, they must, they, they don't understand that you know, the right wing doesn't understand the threat of fascism. That's our enemy, not communism. <laughs> and we're not, there's no way the United States is going to become communist, but hopefully we'll become a social democracy like much of Europe is. Isn't there a big difference in America, speaking as a foreigner, but just having watched a few, if you read about it, is that there's a big difference between the national politics and the local politics. People can be for Trump or Biden, but on the local level, they're all, they are unite, more united. No, I think at the local level, there's a lot of animosity. Yeah, no, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't gotten out there into Trump country yet to do our work. I'm still trying to get funding. We, you know, we're operating, I'm, I'm a full-time volunteer. I'm the executive director, but I, I'm a volunteer. Uh, so I need to raise the money. Next week, I'm actually 
have a visit to a foundation to try and get money to hire an executive director because I'm, I, I, I need someone to take over a younger person. Oh, okay. Uh, and I need a full staff. Once we are fully staffed, we're going to start holding events. My, my theory is that the way that, that the, the concept of, of, of community self-reliance is the meeting place of the left and the right in this country, mm. that the right has always valued self-reliance. The left has always valued community or collaborative efforts. You put the two together, community self-reliance, and I think there's it's not a big step for either side. And that if we're actually working together to build these local supply chains that will reconnect the urban and the rural uh, communities, that uh, our political differences will begin to dissolve, and we'll see that our it's our interdependence on each other and our our mutual understanding and trust between the urban and the rural that is our our future so that's my theory now if it's going to work or not i don't know because i haven't gotten out there and once we get some money we want to start having events in the in the rural areas and try to bring together you know trump people and um you know liberals and uh, without you know obviously talking about politics we're going to talk about the community self-reliance now we need need each other um so I don't know if this is going to work. Or not. All right. It's my thing. We'd have another but conversation of- next year. We should do a follow-up chat. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, but there's, you know, there's some, something happens. I mean, I was just reading in the paper the other day, you know, in the working class section of Philadelphia, how there was a, some kind of a protest about Black Lives Matter. Um, and, a, and a white guy was riding his bike with his girlfriend, you know, past where this protest was. And so he stopped to watch it. and he. He put up the black black power sign or whatever to urge on the you know the 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 Black Lives Matter people, and this white guy, this big guy with tattoos all over him, you know, a former military guy, beat him up, you mm-hmm. know, pulled him off his bike and started punching him in the face and beat him up pretty badly and in front of everybody, um, and then the, the guy later, I mean, he was he was arrested and everything, and and he he, he later said that he feels that he has P- PhD from, or P- what is it? Press. Post-traumatic stress. Yeah. So there's something wrong with me. I don't want to hurt people. You know, I don't want to hurt people, but it's just, um, there's these deep seated, um, it goes back to, you know, colonial times when the elite turned the working class whites against blacks and that still exists. And if we could get over that, you know, and unite working class whites and blacks. And that's why you know, there's a, a black hero, Fred Hampton. He was the leader of the Black Panthers back in Chicago in the 60s, and he was murdered by the FBI. I mean, you know, I mean, they admit it. They, they burst into his home and shot him in bed, killed him. And and the work that he was doing, they said he was the greatest threat to America, but he was actually the greatest threat to the power elite because he started working with Klansmen as a black guy. He, he, he went to, you know, a meeting like with Confederate flags and everything. I know about this because of the, they just did a movie on him. So he saw, he saw the benefit of trying to al- align, you know, poor blacks with poor whites, basically, and that if he could do that, then it would become, you know, hmm. w- w- would be able to overcome, you know, the the tyranny of the of the elite. What's that? So, What's the name of the movie? Uh, it's called the Black Messiah, Judas and the Black Messiah, or the Black Messiah and Judas. It, it it's the, the it's a story about a black guy that betrayed Fred Hampton hmm. and led to his murder. Um, mm. it's either the Black Messiah and Judas or Judas and the Black Messiah. It, it, it sounds better, Judas and the Black Messiah. Oh, uh, it's an excellent movie. I, I recommend it. Very powerful. But yeah, so that 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 is frightening. It's sort of like, you know, they were able to pull off slavery in this country because they were able to convince the poor whites that the blacks were beneath them, you know, so they felt like, okay, mm. I, I'm somebody because I'm better than a black person. You know, this was all this was all um, strategic mm. on the part of slave holders and landowners, you know, to make sure that poor whites and poor and, and slaves did not collude. Mm. Well, I, I think I, get the, I don't think the song's going to stray into that territory. I think I need to keep it more narrow and right, uh, right, right, right. <laughs> positive, right. positive. Yeah, oh, yeah <laughs> exactly. Keep going. Right, right, right. But, you know, right. people people like you who are inspiration, because I, I was just going back to what you said before, I think you did yourself a little disservice because you said, you know, I had this you know, this moment when, you know, you gave 
you know your suppliers to other people and that was yeah that's all that was a progression and that was an enlightening moment but you'd also done you'd, you'd done many things before that of kind of selfless working of, of humanitarian you know trying to raise all the boats no i mean you started right. urban what became urban outfitters the original right. three people well, that's store. Was 23. that was my first husband um he was my boyfriend from when we were 10 years old in fifth grade um, and we went to the Eskimo village together when we came, we were trying to figure out what we we're going to do, you know, and I had thought I'd be a social worker and he had thought he would be in media of some sort, but I realized that being a social worker, because I just wanted to help people, but I, I realized he had to get a master's in, in that. And when I looked at the <laughs> jobs, nothing really appealed to me. So I, it was actually my idea because when I was little, I used to, uh, paint things on scraps of wood and sell them in, on my wagon. <laughs> and down by the highway i said like we should just start a store because all you have to do is buy something at one price and sell it at a higher price <laughs> that's business so yeah. he's all right you know so we looked around our area for a place for the store and we couldn't find anything and then we visited his college roommate who was going to graduate school at warden and he said uh and and also the concept was to was and so again you know i don't talk about this because it sounds like i'm bragging or whatever but the concept for, I had the concept for Urban Outfitters, which was, which I got from the cowboy movies, the idea of the general store. The general store was a place you could go to get everything you needed, you know, for, for the population, your, your food, your clothes, your books, and so on. And it was also a community gathering place that people gathered around the, the, the pot-bellied stove to share stories oh, yeah, yeah. and information. So I wanted to have a store like that with a particular, with a particular focus on a, an age group, which is under 30. So this would be a general store for under 30. So we would have uh, blue jeans, t-shirts, dangly earrings, beads, frisbees, pipes for smoking pot, records, progressive books, mattress bedspreads, you know, Mexican blown glassware, all the things that our generation liked, all in one place. House plants, macrame plant holders. And so it, it just took off and it became what's now called a lifestyle store where you pick a certain segment of the population and, and you address, you know, all of the needs and, and trends and stuff of that particular population. So anyway, so we started it with $3,000, you know, uh, but my, my, my husband was very um, much a sexist. Now, I didn't know that word. I didn't, this was before women's lib. So I, I couldn't even articulate what was wrong. Um, I, I, you know, because I, I grew up in a culture where men are the boss, you know, and, and the, and they're the breadwinners and all this stuff and women are the support people. But when I was treated like that, when I was treated as though I were not an equal, like he and his college roommate would handle all the money. And so they wouldn't even tell me how much we had. And they would just pat me on and don't you worry your pretty little head about that. <laughs> and then they'd say, okay, here's a thousand dollars, go to New York and buy stuff for the store. So I did almost all the buying. I did the decorating, you know, I conceived of the store. But they were all about the money and how they could make more more money. And and this guy from Warden was all about, you know, wealth creation. And I I just felt like I had to get out of there. And, you know, I had he had been my I had wanted to marry him since I was ten years old, you know, and so I it was a huge thing. It was like a heartbreak. And mm. I but I couldn't tell him what was wrong because I didn't know how to articulate women's liberation. You know what I mean? Like I was feeling it. I was feeling like I was trapped and that I couldn't be myself. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't articulate it. Mm. I just knew I had to go. Wow. So I just, I just left. I left everything. I left him, the business, the whole bit and, and went on, went out on my own. And I, you know, I, people say, how did you get in the restaurant business? Well, when I left my husband, I got a half a block away and had a wreck and I had to get a job, fix the car. And this guy was, coming by has witnessed this and he said, can I help you home with your bags? And I said, no, I just left my husband. I have to keep going, but now I have, I have to find a job. And he said, well, I work in a restaurant and there's an opening for a waitress. And I said, oh, well, I'll take it. You know? <laughs> and so that's why I got in the restaurant business by accident. You got half a block, you got <laughs> half a block in the car. Right. Right. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So that was, that was my first business. And I, I, you know, I, I, I think now I don't like to be in any way sour grapes. I mean, certainly what the story is today, it's a, it's a billion dollar plus business. 
and it's international. And that growth, I had nothing to do with. So I, I'm not trying to take credit for what it became. But And I feel uncomfortable um, saying it was all my idea, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. You know I mean? So so I don't talk about it. But it, it does um, bother me that the store is so, se is so is very sexist. I had one of Dick's cousins used to work there and actually approached me because they felt that I had a better model <laughs> than what Urban Outfitters was at the White Dog. But well, that's interesting, um, you know, because maybe if you hadn't had that formative experience, you hadn't been pushed in that direction, then maybe you wouldn't have created, you know, White Dog and you wouldn't have developed in this way. So, you know, maybe everything is for the better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, and then, and then you know, in between Urban Outfitters and White Dog, I, I, I worked at La Terrasse for 10 years. And my big heartbreak was when I had a falling out with my partner there and he forced me out of the business. And, for, and at first I was like devastated, but then that's what led to my starting the white dog and, and then not having to be saddled with having this guy as, as my partner. Right. Um, I was let loose, you know, to do something that was totally my own creation and not have to compromise, you know, with some guy, um, you know, I was married. And so in a sense, in, in, in the United States, whatever you create, as a married person, your your spouse owns half of. Um, so I had to when I got divorced, I had to pay him for half the half the value of the business I had built, which I was afraid was going to kill me, but it, it didn't. You know, I survived and so <laughs> on. Yeah. But what? Because my because the way I heard about you first of all is um, my friend w when I graduated university, I went to stay in America with a friend of mine who a friend of my dad's friend, an English guy, and he he went to America and he, he made his fortune there, you know, painting houses and then buying them and selling them on and renting them out to students in, in Boulder, Colorado. I actually had him a guest on the podcast, one of my first guests. And, but anyway, he says when people, because people ask him for business advice because he's got very successful, you know, and he says, well, just tell them to buy good morning, beautiful business, because that's really, <laughs> yeah, because if you raise all the boats and I think what he said was the most revolutionary idea or something that you paid you paid everyone the, uh, a salary that was in what was it a third of yours salary or something like that what or uh, oh uh that that the ratio between the highest and the right. and the lowest paid shouldn't be more than five times five times was it okay was that yeah so every time your um, your salary grew you you had you paid paid a higher rate to all the bus boys and the waitresses and the chefs so right so you got the right. best people in town because everyone wanted to work with you because you started paying so much more than everyone else right right well, so we 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 raised that you know position which is typically a dishwasher from you know minimum wage to I think I can't remember the time I think some the minimum wage was like three fifty an hour or something or three seventy five mm -hmm. an hour and we made our minimum wage six dollars an hour which back then was and um and, and then you know and and when we did that my biggest fear was that the the, the other people that were making higher salaries would all want raises if everybody wanted a raise we wouldn't be able to afford it but everybody was glad that the dishwashers came up you know and they did feel like they had to go up too you know just like becoming more equal so yeah, but a lot that but a lot of people wouldn't do that because going back to what you said before, that fear of letting go, that fear that because I think a lot of small businesses people they're, they're worried about, you know, having something reserved for next year. There's a lot of unconscious fear that if they pay people too much, they and you know they haven't maybe have no reserves or do, do you think that there was some element of letting go when you made a decision to do that? letting go yeah letting go of your fear and saying okay i'm going to really do this well, yeah. yes it, it is all about letting go of our fear of not having enough for ourselves that is the fear that keeps people um being stingy they're afraid of not having enough and even though they have plenty you know so they keep it, uh, accumulating because they're afraid and, and rich people are the same way. I mean, and, and in particular, they are that way. Mm. Um, they're afraid of not having enough. No course for them, and not this like you know having yachts and you know flying around the world and all this kind of to keep up the lifestyle that they're accustomed to and have those friends and whatnot. It is a fear based that stinginess, greed, is based in fear. What what else do we want to cover? Because I, I also spoke to Joel Backer on the show, and he got me really inspired about the and the way the corporates, the in, corporate institution, shall we say that is at the heart of all what you're talking about, all the problems, because the corporate structure, if they weren't, if they weren't driven purely for profit, for shareholder benefit, 
if they were benefit corporations, then we would also not be in this situation as well, no? Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I really admire B Corp. Um, d have you heard of B Corp no, before? It's, it, 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 it stands for a benefit corporation where they've actually made it a legal designation because, at least in the United States, that legally the board of directors of a corporation must make decisions, the board and the staff must make decisions for the best interest of the stockholders above all else. Um, and being becoming a B Corp uh, legally allows you to make decisions based on the, on the, on the good of all, okay. you know, uh, the environment, the workers, the community or whatever, without being sued by your stockholders that you made a decision that reduced the profit in order to benefit other stakeholders. So B Corp has actually been passed in a number of different states. And so, for instance, when Ben and Jerry's mm. was forced to sell, uh, sell to Unilever, that's why they were forced to sell. They, they didn't want to sell the corporation to Unilever, but they would have been sued by their stockholders for not selling. because really? it was, uh, So, yes. So that's part of what inspired this idea of, of B Corp so that, you know, if you're a B Corporation, you can make decisions. You, you can say, no, I'm not going to sell out to a larger corporation, which would be a bonanza for my stockholders, because that jeopardizes the far the small farmers that supply my business and, and you know, my workers who would all of a sudden be working for another corporation and, and, and take the community, the corporation out of my own community, you know, where there's many benefits and so on like that 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 would be, a, a con you wouldn't be sued by your stockholders to make such a decision. Um, and so you can become a B, the other thing they do is they certify a corporations as being a B Corp. Okay. So in order to be a B Corp, you have to uh, fill out a survey about the questions you, about every aspect of your business. And you have to have a certain score in order to become a B Corp. And the White Dog was the second B Corp in the world when they first started because the guys who um, invented B Corp, founded B Corp, happened to be friends of mine that, that live in the Philadelphia area. Um, and so when when they first started B Corp, it, when it was just the very beginning, now it's an international. They have they have chapters all over the place. I, where was I? In France, I, I, I met the leader of, the, of B Corp there. I don't know if there's one in Italy or not, but mm -hmm. in many countries, there's a, a, a local organizer for B Corp in that particular country. There's one in Taiwan. There was one in Taiwan when I was speaking there one time I met him. When they first started it, they wanted to have a, a, a signing. There were um, a, another fellow who was the first B Corp and I were the first two. So they wanted to have a, a signing of this, what they called a declaration of interdependence. Um, and so they held that ceremony at my restaurant. Uh, so the founders of B Corp and, and the two first businesses, myself and the other fellow and, and others, you know, gathered for when we signed the Declaration of Interdependence, had a little party and whatnot. Um, but anyway, that's the, so I do believe that it is possible to, to transform corporations to be more aligned with the common good. But quite frankly, I, I you know, even there, I, I have my doubts about it because it's still, it's still a, a system that pulls uh, wealth from communities, it, it consolidates wealth. So, you know, I, I believe that the only way really to have more equal, equality is to decentralize ownership, that it's only through ownership that we have real uh, e equality and freedom, as far as I'm concerned, to be able to, you know, create and innovate. So I feel like there's two movements in the social responsible business world. One movement is to reform and, and, and transition large corporations to be um, agents of the common good, as opposed to just generating profit. And the other movement is to create an alternative economy, which is locally based. So uh, I, at one point, was trying to work on, in both areas. And a friend and mentor, David Corden, who wrote When Corporations World, Rule the World, he kind of shook me by the shoulders and said, Judy, you know, forget about, you know, Ben and Jerry's and the body shop and, you know, all these progressive big corporations. That's not where your work is. You've got to create the Judy economy, you know, the decentralized <laughs> right, um, right. logo. And that's your, that's your work. That was true. And it, and it set me on that path to, to found Bali and other organizations that for me, you know, it, it, it's, it's my, it's my life's work. And so now, you know, at 74, I'm still doing that work because it's not over yet at all. This is my 
latest nonprofit called All Together Now Pennsylvania is 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 kind of the probably the last effort I in terms of starting a new organization. I'm, I'm uh, recording you know, this I'm conversation so I can play it back to you in a couple of years when you're on your when you're on <laughs> another <laughs> venture. Yeah. Well, the only other nonprofit, I mean, the only one that I'll do around local economies, the only other nonprofit project I want to do while I still can um, is to bring attention to the to animal testing. Um, no, there's a lot of groups that are working on that, but in particular, one of the main animals that's used for really, you know, needless torment and torture uh, is the is a dog, uh, the beagle, a, a beagle dog. You know what I mean? The, what a beagle, mm -hmm. the breed is. Yeah. It's a tricolor dog. It's used for hunting rabbits and so on. Anyway, I've had beagles all my life since I, and I have one now who's howling out in the woods here. <laughs> but that was my first pet when I was nine. And uh, beagles are one of the main dogs used for consumer testing. Like they, they, they feed them poisons to see how it affects the, you know, detergents and um, pesticides and whatever to see what the tolerance is, levels and whatnot. It, it's, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And they, and they, and they, they test beagles, they put gas masks on them and force them to smoke cigarette smoke. They have one of the most refined noses in the world. This for, for hundreds of years been refined, you know, to hunt rabbits and they have great endurance for running, you know, through the woods to chase the rabbits. And here they are kept in these tiny cages their entire lives, forced to smoke cigarette smoke so that their lungs can then be cut, cut open and you know, see what different uh, cigarette filters, you know, are effective or not. I mean, horrible, horrible things. This just really burns me up. And it, 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 it's so, you know, every day when I see my own little beagle dog and how sweet she is, I mean, it's the reason they use beagles is because they are so trusting and forgiving. Like the, the technicians that handle beagles say that they're very forgiving, that they still wag their tail when the tormentor comes in the room. They're very easy to handle. They're, you know, short legs, short hair, don't bite. And they, you know, just the perfect dog to experiment on. They're an old breed, so it's a stable breed. Um, so it's horrible what, 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 I mean, we're talking about a major industry here where millions of beagles are bred in the United States, but also in other countries, India and England, you know, the breed originally originated in England actually, which is one of the countries that is a forerunner in animal rights movement, yeah. but it still exists there that the abuse of beagles. So anyway, I, I, I want to bring attention, uh, to this. Uh, most people don't know that. No, and a lot know. of people have beagles as pets and they know how sweet they are. So. I hope I, I can still do that. And my what I'm going to do is Halloween, I've often dressed up like a beagle. <laughs> I've been a, a nursing mother beagle when I had a little infant who I dressed as a, pup, a beagle puppy. <laughs> and I've been a, a male beagle, you know, that's peed on fire hydrants and whatnot. So <laughs> and I have a whole like outfit, a, a beagle outfit. So my idea is to have like a beagle, beagle brigade, you know, with maybe, I don't know, 10 people dressed as beagles. And we go into a coffee shop or whatever and get everybody's attention in kind of a humorous way when people are open and then hand them the brochures, you know, about the torture of beagles and getting them to, you know, to join an organization to, to stop this. Um, so anyway, that's what I, that's, that that's going to be my last, uh, my last, my last effort, but I, I have to get all together now funded and, 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 uh, delegated, mm -hmm. you know, so that, and that's my local economy work. And that's really my life's work okay. I've been working on all this time, but, um, the, the big old, the helping the beagles is something I've wanted to do since I was nine. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, when I was nine and had a beagle, I received a brochure from the anti-vivisection. I, I don't know. I guess they got my name for, because I signed up for something at the pet store or whatever. Um, and you know, th there was a photograph of a beagle being uh, strapped down on an operating table being experimented on. And that photograph is still in my mind from when I first saw it when I was nine, I was so, I could not believe this. And I gave my first donation of my life, of my allowance to the anti-vib section <laughs> society. And so I swore when I was nine that I was going to do something to help the beagles. So this is like, you know, now I'm 74, there's not a lot of time left, but I'm hoping before I'm 80, you know, I'll be able to start this and start going into coffee shops dressed as beagles okay. <laughs> but it's all you know corporations still again the same uh yes you know, and if it was local yes. you know if it was a local organization and nobody in the village you know would nobody in the town or the, or the or yeah fred exactly. fred at number exactly. 32 has beagles strapped down to the table and his feet in them exactly smoke. exactly he'd, he'd be he'd be he'd be chased out of town no i mean all the you call the right Exactly. So, like people don't know it's secret, yeah. secret thing.
Yeah, because I could think, you know, these corporations that are there an idea, you know, they're 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 we created them with they're a thought construction there. And I heard you talking to Michael Schumann as well on many times and you know, he, he trying to combat them with other ideas, you know, like a local stock market and things like that. And so do you see right. do you see any of these ideas sticking? Uh, yes, uh, and I think that that the climate change that what we do today to localize our economy and develop self reliance and our basic needs will mean the survival or not of future generations. So uh, I I feel that climate change as it gets worse and worse is is going to uh, the people will I think they already are beginning to I mean I think the the movement to support from farmers markets which is huge in the United States part of that. A part of people's intuition to to buy from local farmers and build that system. The pandemic has shown us how important that is, and I think that that the happiness that comes from going to the farmers market and and knowing the far, the farmer who grows your food and talking to your neighbors is 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 a manifestation, you know, of this movement and what will continue to draw people to it. You know, knowing who makes your clothes. You know, no, knowing who. Who, who who produces your building materials and you know, knowing who grows your plant medicine, you know, all these things, the basis of healthy community life, healthy and happy community life. So I, I feel that it's, uh, that when people are happy, they're drawn towards those things. Mm. Um, and, you know, I have another nonprofit called the Circle of Aunts and Uncles. It's a micro lo a loan fund where we provide low interest, 3% interest loans to local entrepreneurs. And so I have uh, one side, there's baby boom generation retirees who have money, experience, time, and so on. And then you have the young entrepreneurs that are struggling and don't have the capital that they don't have families that provide that family stage capital for their businesses. So I've combined these, these two potentials. And I've had this organization for six years now, and it's been very successful. And part of the success is that the aunts and uncles um, not only put in their money, but they also provide advice and guidance. But now they've become advocates for local economies because, you know, those that we loan to are mostly food and clothing businesses. They're producing basic needs. So now, you know, the aunts and uncles, like just to see, especially the aunts, they, they, they'll, they, they come to the meetings wearing locally made clothes. Like I'm wearing Lobo Ma. Mm. That's one of our... Um, our, our, we call them nieces and nephews. Mm. So we just had our family reunion, our uh, celebrating our sixth anniversary, and all the aunts and uncles and the nieces and nephews all come together to celebrate the entrepreneurs and how they all made it to the pandemic. And so there's personal, and there's also commitment to to local, to buying the products of these local entrepreneurs. One business it turns waste uh, glass into new objects. They they blow old bottles into bowls and chandeliers and whatnot. Like the glasses in my house all come from there. If I go to a party, I dress up and wear the Lobo Ma clothes. Um, so we're, 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 we're increasing the demand, you know, for mm -hmm. local. Um, and I think that that is going to be my hope <laughs> is that more and more people will see the beauty of that instead of buying fast fashion, you know, that's just throwaway clothes that are made in sweatshops. Um, that we buy much less clothes, that we cut down our clothing maybe a tenth of what it has been in the past, and that we buy clothes that are well made, that are made locally, that are are more expensive because they are not made in sweatshops, mm. but they'll last longer. And we don't have to have a new dress for every party. Um, that we actually take pride in wearing wearing the same clothes, yeah. you know, and it, which doesn't mean they wear the same dress every day or anything by any means. But we all, you know, at this point in our society, have a closet full of clothes that we don't wear. We have too much, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one of the one of the gluts in the in the waste stream um, is 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 discarded clothing. It's one of the biggest things that's discarded is is clothing. So we we just wear it for a while and we throw it away. You know, some people take the time to take it to the Goodwill, but even Goodwill has more clothes than they can get rid of. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have to stop buying, and when we do buy, to buy local. So. I, and I do, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pollyanna opt overly optimistic, <laughs> but I feel that, that we are going to head in that direction because more and more we'll intuitively begin to feel um, that we need to have self-reliance. I think we're feeling that about food. 
um, and energy as well. You know, uh, I want to buy from locally produced renewable energy companies. Uh, that's another thing that we we are pushing because that builds up our region's capacity to provide energy. And we need to keep growing that capacity because we don't have it now. We're importing, um, you know, our, our utility grid uses, you know, natural gas and fossil, other fossil fuels. And Pennsylvania is a, a big state for fracking natural gas. And so that, you know, I've gotten involved with that anti-fracking movement, but you know, it, it, it is all about local. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we didn't, I don't, I stopped using natural gas because of fracking. When I realized the 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 harm that fracking was doing to the environment and to the communities that live near the mm -hmm. fracking sites and the communities that live near the pipeline sites, I, I, I stopped using natural gas. I, I converted my house to all, which comes from solar, uh, on my solar on my roof and solar mm -hmm. from my third party supplier and just had my natural gas cut off. And I feel like we, we mm. all these little steps all I have to keep making. And so all together now is a way of educating people about all this, you know, what do we need to do in the area of renewable energy? What do we do need to do in the area of clothing and plant medicine and so on to become self-reliant? So a lot of it is about consciousness raising. I haven't, I can't say I have all the answers because this is all an experiment and we're going into new territory to see, you know, whether we can create programs that in fact do raise consciousness and, and that people can see uh, and feel our interconnection with other people and with other species and, 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 and that we are as humans part of the web of life, you know, and that what happens uh, to the web happens to us, you know, uh, and that we're not separate and superior and controlling of that web of life. How could we ever have thought so? Uh, people, some people still do. Mm. So anyway, so that's like the big job is, is uh, you know, is I think once people, once people understand that we're all connected, yeah. um, that foundational belief, then then you then you want to make decisions for the good of all because yeah. it's 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 enlightened self interest, you know. And as long as we believe that we're separate, that's when we're fearful, as you mentioned earlier. And we want to get as much as we can for ourselves, so that's about greed and competition and so on because we're separate and we have to take care of ourselves. But once we get over that, then we can move from fear to love, and we can move from competition to cooperation we can move you know from accumulation and hoarding to generosity and sharing and move from from me to we but so the basis of all this work is is really about consciousness raising but i feel like the best way to raise consciousness is to get people to work together you know to build local self-reliance if we're on the same team and we're co-creating for the Good of all. So it's not a theory, but we're what we're actually doing now, where it can, uh, as it did for me. I'm looking like, how did I get into this racket? It, it was because I, I moved from me to we. Um, and so I keep thinking, like, how did that happen? And how can I help others to move from me to we, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and to understanding the abundance, you know, that, that there is enough for all, there's enough for all if we share. You know, and and that's what I learned from the Eskimos. And in addition, people continue to teach me. You know, the Eskimos first about you know a culture of sharing and and cooperation, and then the Zapatistas. Uh, it was from the Zapatistas that I began to understand what was happening globally. Their fight against globalization it was their fight was is about uh, it was about and still is about local self reliance. They want to be able to grow their corn for their domestic marketplace. And not be forced um, to work in plantations or into in, in maquiladoras to, you know, to, to be in these sweatshops and whatnot. And so that's when I uh, for, it was working with them when I first realized that a global economy could be a, a network of sustainable regional economies. And then more recently, I went to Standing Rock uh, in 2016 and brought a group of, of, of 30 people with me. And we cooked a Thanksgiving dinner for the water protectors. And and again, I was inspired to to work against the black snake that the Lakotas call the fossil fuel industry and to go home and find the black snake in my own community, which was fracking. You know, and, and, and now, you know, you know, I, I'm always thinking about indigenous philosophy being the basis of what we need to do now as white people, as white settlers we are, that we need to learn from the people who's whose land this is yeah. <laughs> about reciprocity. You know, that's one of the basic 
beliefs of indigenous people worldwide is about reciprocity, you know, the balance of giving and taking. And white settlers are, uh, you know, just took and we keep taking and that's what's destroying the world. Um, and so we need to be in balance and give back as much as we take. And that's a very simple thing that people need to understand. If we just keep taking, it's going to destroy the world. Well, I think you just wrote the lyrics to the song there. That was very poetic. <laughs> oh, I thought we've been talking more than an hour. Yeah, right? no, I think I'm fully inspired, so I could get to work on it. I just want to just want to say that, you know, you've won all, I was thinking before how, you know, you've won all these humanitarian awards, you know, basically for being a nice person, you know, it's kind of, it's ironic. It's kind of, it's crazy that you, you, you get celebrated just because you're just being nice. You know, this, sh you shouldn't be celebrated. You should just be an average person though. It's the rest of us who are, right. the rest of us who are just down here, you know, it's an indictment on <laughs> us, you know, it's not. You're not doing. You're you're not doing it. You're not doing an amazing job. You're just doing what you should be doing. So, right. You know, I, I shouldn't be the. I should be the norm. Yeah, should, oh, Judy. Yeah, uh, she's doing what she does. Everyone. So, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, isn't it? In that way, when you look at it that way. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, it took me a long time to realize that I wasn't the norm. You know, as I always thought of myself as being a, nor a normal person, but it's what I hope the norm will be. Not, not that I'm perfect by any means. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. You know, there, I think for every person, we continue to struggle, you know, with finding the right balances in our, in our lives, you know, of giving and taking of, you know, of being, being at one, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, with the universe and to have that calmness uh, and peace and security of feeling our oneness, you know, is always a struggle. We can't, at least for me, I can't be in that state all the time. I, I can achieve it, but I, I, I lose it and I have to get it back. <laughs> That's good. That's rest, good to rest. Know the rest of us to know you're still human in that respect. And, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to crack out a song here and then I'll send it over to you and tell me what you think. And, um, then we'll release it to the world. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Jack. No worries. <laughs> Thanks again, Judy. It's been really a pleasure okay. chatting to you. All right. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All our problems come When we get outside ourselves We need to grow our communities And seize new opportunities we gotta move from me to me Think reciprocity It's time we move from me to me Think one community All together now All together now All together now All together now
Rebecca Jenkins for those amazing vocals. If you want to hear the song again, it's available on all music streaming services or for a $1 download from podsongs.com. You can also subscribe there for our newsletter, for all other news and updates. A big thanks to our musical production team here in Italy, Maurizio Sanicola, Massimino Vozza and Luigi Falcione, and my researcher, Dori Verbo. Please help us by sending this episode to your friends, sharing it on social media, and reviewing it wherever you can. I also have another show to listen to. It's called The Mystic Cast, and it's about spirituality, UFOs, mysticism, the occult, and the Ethereum Society, the teachings of which led me to start this project, serving the servers, helping those who help others. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great day.